You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, two portions, in Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. The title of the message today is, Thank You, Lord, for Saving My Soul. I wonder how often you thank God for saving your soul. I do that every day, sometimes many times during the day. I'm overwhelmed with the gracious gift of eternal life. And all through the day, every day, I'm reminded over and over how little I deserve that. Not at all. I deserve nothing. The concept of giving God thanks for saving us, for saving our soul, I think is quite appropriate for Thanksgiving Sunday. The two key verses, let me just read those again for you, because that's what it's talking about. In Romans 1, 8, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's what Paul is giving thanks for. And then in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, as it is, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Again, saving faith and Paul giving thanks without ceasing because they had received the word of God and been saved. Now you know, over the last several weeks we've been studying how light is presented in the scripture. And although today is a special message related to Thanksgiving, I think it ties in very well with what we have just been learning. The salvation of our souls for which we give grateful thanks was the sovereign act of God who actively, personally, when we were dead in sin, he actively shined light into our souls. We could not have been saved had God not sovereignly acted first. Let me read you the verses that say that in their context. This is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 or chapter 4 verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now listen to this next part. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now here he's going to compare creation, ex nihilo, that is out of nothing, with salvation. Creation didn't make itself. That's the evolutionary viewpoint. God had to speak the word and have creation take place. The same thing is true for our salvation. God had to shine the light. God had to speak the word for us to be saved. You didn't save yourself. You were dead, not sick in sin. You were dead in sin. Dead men don't cause themselves to live. Dead matter doesn't cause itself to give forth life. And so what Paul says is, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's all of God and not of man. You were dead. You were in darkness. And God shined the light of the gospel and drew you to Christ. Have you ever thanked him for that? Paul goes on in verse 7, For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You know, salvation produces a lot of things, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the message today, but but look at how Paul responded, being saved, what it caused him to do. Verses 8 and following, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus 
might be made manifest in our body. Salvation changes lives. Doesn't matter what your circumstances of life, salvation changes your life and changes my life too. It lets you go through all of those difficult things that Paul listed there. But the purpose was that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest, that is openly exposed in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. If you thank God for your salvation, it's the only thing that can change your life to be like that. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Are you saved? If you are saved, you will speak. You can't help but speak. You can't help but give praise and thanksgiving to God. Are you doing it? If not, do you know if you're saved? You know theology, but are you saved? Paul says this is the way that his salvation transformed his life. We believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. Ah, oh, there's an impact on the lives of others. If you're saved, it will not only transform you, it will make an impact on the life of someone else. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God the way in which it will make an impact will produce what we're all about today. Thanksgiving that will super overflow, that's what redound means, will super overflow to the glory of God. Does your life produce that in the lives of others? When they see the impact that you are making for Christ, when they feel the impact that you are making upon them, does it then produce thanksgiving to God? It should, if you're saved. This is a great salvation. Salvation is something we sort of banter around with and we talk about being saved and think in terms just of, well, it means we're going to get to heaven someday. But thanksgiving for salvation in all of its aspects, what it does to us now and through us now. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. And that was a motivator for Paul, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He was so excited because he saw what salvation was doing in his life and through his life, what impact it made for others coming to Christ and then what it was doing in their lives and the whole body of Christ rejoicing and giving thanksgiving together because of the salvation that God had given to them. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Salvation coupled with thanksgiving refocuses our attention from things on earth the things in heaven. That's what Paul says here. While we look not at the things which are seen, those are the things of earth, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's a powerful passage. It tells us a great deal about the connection between salvation and thanksgiving. Another passage along the same line. End of Paul's life. And yet we find once again this great truth in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. Paul wanted to pass it on to make sure it didn't stop with his generation. He wanted to pass it on. 
Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Did you notice Paul spoke of himself as the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ? He wasn't the prisoner of Rome, because Rome wouldn't be able to touch him if God didn't want it. He was really the prisoner of the Lord Jesus. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us. It goes back to that moment. That moment that God irresistibly drew you to Christ. That moment in which God shined the light into your heart. That moment in which God regenerated your dead human spirit and gave you life. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. That's transformational. He didn't just call us. He called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works. We didn't earn this, folks. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. <laughs> Have you ever thanked God that for whatever reason that in eternity past, before the world began, he reached down and chose you? I have no idea why he chose me. But oh, am I thankful? Oh, am I grateful? As I look into eternity future and as I consider the fires of hell and darkness and blackness and torment. And then as I see the glories of heaven. People, if you understand that, your heart should overflow with thanksgiving. So great salvation. So great salvation. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse 10. But is now, present tense, made manifest. That is, it becomes visible all around by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It's the gospel by which you're saved. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You can't save yourself. Only God can save you. And he always does it the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. Because Christ is the only one who has sufficiently paid the sacrifice for your sins. John tells us the same thing in 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We've already learned that Jesus is the source of spiritual light for salvation and sanctification. And so we can truly say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, because it is all of God and none of us. However, from our two passages today, we learn certain key things for which the truly saved can give thanks. And I hope that you learn some of these things so that every day you will say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Back there to that chapter in Romans, chapter 1, verse 7, where we began our text verses. Paul wrote, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three key elements in that verse which relate to our salvation and which relate to thanksgiving. Three key elements in verse 7 that relate to our salvation and that relate to thanksgiving. Number one, if we are saved, it proves God loves us. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God. The first thing is it proves God loves us. Have you given him thanks for that? If you're saved, it proves God loves you. Number two, if we are saved, we have a name based on our chief occupation. It says called to be saints. 
That word is used several times, scattered throughout the New Testament. It means to be given a name based on your chief occupation. You've been called, you've been set apart, but you've been called to be saints. That should be your chief occupation. Those who have been set apart for service to God. That's an amazing thing for which to give thanks, that God would actually use us in his service. If you're saved, that means God is going to use you. Have you given him thanks for that? The third thing we see in verse 7. If we are saved, we are recipients of God's grace and peace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Recipients of grace and peace. That means under grace our guilt is expunged. Under peace our anxiety is quenched. Have you ever given God thanks for that? Those are amazing things for which we can give God thanks that connect thanksgiving to salvation. But now in verse 8 we have the statement concerning what is the most important thing in our thanksgiving, our salvation itself. Look at verse 8. First, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for your all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith is the key that brings you to salvation. And Paul talks about it here, and the first thing he thanks God for, we learn several things about salvation from verse 8. Number one, it causes others to give thanks to God as well. Paul is giving thanks for their faith. Number two, that Jesus Christ is the center of thanksgiving. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center of thanksgiving. Number three, that genuine salvation for which we give thanks is publicly open and discussed by other people. Did you get that other? That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Are you saved? One of the tests, and Paul makes it clear, he's not talking about his faith, he's talking about their faith. These are believers in a church at Rome, at the heart of the oppression, the place where Christianity is hated. And yet he says, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. If you have genuine faith, is it being publicly and openly discussed by others? They are amazed at how clear your testimony is? <laughs> We as Americans try to live in the shadows, don't we? It's so pleasant here. You know, in countries where they've already lost it all and they have basically nothing else to lose except their own lives, they're open in public about their testimony. But we want so badly to hold on to the things of earth. But the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Don't focus on things of earth. Those are the temporal things. By faith, with thanksgiving, set your eyes on the things of heaven, the eternal things that last forever. Next, verse 9 and 10. We can be thankful for our salvation because it establishes the foundation for our fellowship. Two things we learn from that. Verses 9 and 10, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Our salvation, for which we give thanks, establishes the foundation of our fellowship. Two things. Number one, it produces a bond of intense, earnest desire to pray for other believers. Did you see what he said? That without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. That's a habitual, continual prayer life for other believers, not just for himself, for other believers. Number two, it produces an intense desire to join with other believers in fellowship. 
making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Do you have an intense desire to have fellowship with other believers? It's one of the things that is in the center of your heart all day long, how you look forward to being together with other believers on Sunday. And so you come to Sunday school and Sunday morning worship and Sunday evening worship and you can hardly wait for Wednesday so that you can be together with the believers on Wednesday. And then when we have special activities on Friday, you want to be there on Friday because you want to get together with And you call each other on the phone all day long and talk about the things of the Lord and you never talk about the trivia of earth, but you only talk about the things of the Lord because you're so excited about Jesus. I speak with tongue in cheek, of course. That's what Paul said, it produced an intense desire in him to join with other believers in fellowship. Next, we can be thankful for our salvation because it connects us to other believers and makes us one body through the spiritual gifts. You see, these things are all tied together by Paul here in Romans chapter 1. Don't disconnect them. They're all part of that initial statement. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And he continues his thought as we move down into verses 11 and 12. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. In other words, it's not just for me, uh, not just for you, it's for me too. Because together, we are part of the same body. Do you look at the other believers in this church as part of the same body? and that a body must function together. A body that is dysfunctional can't get anything done. You know, if the head is giving certain directions to the arm and telling it to reach over this way, and the arm is doing this, nothing happens, right? Or if the head gives directions to the left arm and says, now I want you to reach over to the left and uh, touch that wall, and the arm sits there. And just like that. So I will not do it. I will not do it! Okay, right arm, go over to the left arm, grab it. Pull it over there. That's not the way the body's supposed to work, is it? But Paul is talking about the gifts here. We can be thankful for our salvation because it connects us to other believers, makes us one body for the spiritual gifts. I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. Four points under this. Number one, our salvation enables us to interact with others in the same body. Our salvation, for which we give thanks, enables us to interact with others in the same body. Number two, our salvation enables us to help other believers become established. Too often we're only focused on ourselves. But our salvation is supposed to be to edify the body. The gifts that God gives you are not for yourself to benefit you. They are designed by God. And we did a whole series on the 22 original spiritual gifts, seven of which were only temporary gifts during the, during the days of the apostles. But there are still 14 other gifts that are available that you can minister to the body of Christ with. It enables other believers, helps us to enable other believers to become established. Number three, our salvation enables us to comfort one another in times of distress. Did you see that in verse 12? That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. In other words, when Paul talked about exercising his spiritual gift at Rome, he knew that at the same time the believers at Rome would be ministering to him with their spiritual gifts and say, well, but nobody had a gift like Paul. I mean, Paul is really unique. In the, but the Apostle Paul also was part of the body and he needed to have others minister to him and his ministry could not have been what it was had not the rest of the body of Christ been ministering to him. And we see that all the way through the book of Acts. They're believers in different places. They encourage Paul's heart. They provide for him financially. They provide food and clothing and shelter. You are important in the body of Christ. Never think of yourself as, well, I'm way so down on the totem pole that, uh, you know, I really don't matter. You are essential and God gave you the necessary gifts to function with the local assembly where God places you so that the body can grow together in love. Number four, our salvation enables us to perfectly identify with others who have the same 
faith. Did you get that in the last part of the verse? Comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. We identify with others who have the same faith. These are elements of your salvation for which you can give thanks and not just say, thank you, Lord, for saving me, but say, wow, because I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, that this is true. And thank you, Lord, that this is true. And thank you, Lord, that this is true. And you put it together and you say, wow, this is a great salvation. The second passage, let's move now down to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In the second passage, we learn a lot more of reasons why we can thank God for saving our souls. Verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Sounds like a nasty group of people. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Let's look at that verse 13. First, our salvation causes joy in others. That's the key theme you see there in verse 13. Our salvation causes joy in others, particularly those who had a part in leading us to Christ. You know, it, it gives me great, heart, uh, great thanksgiving and joy in my heart when I have the privilege of leading someone to Christ. This last Christmas I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with one of my granddaughters, a little five-year-old. And... Uh, her daddy had brought her in, one of my sons, and asked me to talk to her about salvation. He said, I think she's ready to trust Christ. And so I, I shared with her, it's little Abby, and um, what joy. And when she made it clear that she understood, I said to my son Philemon, I said, why don't you lead her in prayer so that she will confess Christ with her lips? And he did, and she prayed a beautiful little prayer, tiny little girl and was so happy afterwards because she knew she was saved. What joy. Our salvation causes joy in others. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Let me just list a few things that we learn. There are at least six, five different things here that we learn in verse 13. Number one, since our salvation is eternally secure, since our salvation is eternally secure, it produces a thanksgiving that is perpetual. Did you get that? We thank God without ceasing. Because your salvation is secure, it produces a perpetual thanksgiving. You don't say, well, thank you, Lord, for saving Joe. Oh, he just lost it again. Well, I guess I can't thank you for that anymore. <laughs> Produces perpetual thanksgiving. Number two, we give grateful thanks for our salvation because it is based on the unchanging word of God, not the changing word of man. That's why you can thank God for your salvation. It's because it is based on the unchanging word of God, not on the changing word of man. Number three, we give more grateful thanks because genuine salvation, now listen carefully, genuine salvation responds to the word of God with a changed life. We give thanks to God for our salvation because genuine salvation responds to the word of God with a changed life. If you claim to be saved and you can read the Bible and it tells you what to do and you sort of slough it off, you better prove yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith or whether you'd be reprobate, as Paul says. We give grateful thanks because genuine salvation responds to the word of God with a changed life. Did you catch that in that phrase? 
as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe if you believe the word of God is going to effectually work in you we give praise and thanksgiving for our salvation this is number four because the word of God is effectual in transforming our lives through faith because the word of God is effectual in transforming our lives through faith number five we give thanks to God because he causes our faith to grow that's what effectually working is dealing with that's talking about your spiritual growth the change in life is a is an indicator that something alive inside is growing within you but there's more here in verses 14 through 16 we thank God for saving our souls because it's changed our lives in the following ways number one there are six of these this is verses let me read the verses so you'll see them as we're picking them up for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men you say well what in the world is can you give thanks for and those those will sound like terrible verses what can we give thanks for them? forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost where is Thanksgiving in that all right let's talk about it six things that we learn about Thanksgiving to God for saving our souls and the change in our lives number one it made us aware of the testimony of others and caused us to follow their example that's verse 14 for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus they said there are some more mature Christians around than us let's see where are they Wow the first church that got started was a church in Jerusalem they're the ones that have been Christians long enough uh, longer than we have uh, they, they're the first ones out there let's see how it's transformed them let's follow their example what are they having to face uh, do we learn anything from that is there some way we can apply it here in Thessalonica the answer absolutely yes so we can give thanks because it made us aware of the testimony of others and caused us to follow their example number two that great salvation that God has provided for us it made us willing to suffer for the cause of Christ for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen even as they have of the Jews have you ever given God Thanksgiving that your salvation is of such depth and such quality that it has made you willing to suffer for Jesus uh, you want to scratch that one off the list right let's not talk about that stuff let's, let's talk about the good stuff that we give thanks for this is good stuff because God is refining you God is purifying you God is cleansing you God is conforming you to the image of Christ and he was perfect and he suffered he never sinned no deceit or guile was ever found in his mouth but he suffered this kind of salvation for which we give thanks has made us aware of the testimony of others caused us to follow their example it has made us willing to suffer for the cause of Christ number three it has made us willing to openly identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and the heroes of faith it has made us willing to openly identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and the heroes of faith did you see that who have both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets those are some heroes of faith there number four it made us willing to gladly accept persecution from God haters and obnoxious persons <laughs> I like the way Paul phrases that in verse 15 and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men these are obnoxious people but it has made us willing to gladly accept persecution from God haters and heroes of the faith and obnoxious people 
question for you. Do you know any obnoxious people? When you try to witness to them, have they ever cursed at you? I've had people curse at me when I witness to them. Did you smile? Or did you sort of buckle down and tighten up and sneak away? The Apostle Paul dealt with that kind of people all the time. And if you've been going through the book of Acts with us, you know that he never backed down. He was God's bulldog. And even when they stoned him and left him for dead, after the disciples gathered around him and pulled the stones off, he stood back up and he didn't run away. He went back into the city. I suspect they saw him coming and thought, whoa, we've got to watch out for that guy. Number five, if you have genuine salvation, and I hope you do, and for this you can give thanks, it will make you willing to stand up to those who try to prohibit the spreading of the gospel. That's verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. What is more important, your personal comfort or the salvation of someone who's lost? What's more important? I had to use this particular point with one of my children a number of years ago, grown now, of course all my kids are grown now, but, um, and I had to ask that particular person, that particular child of mine, what's more important? What you want right now, because there was a situation that, that child was facing, what's more important that you want right now? or the salvation of this person over here. Because this one was being stubbornly, recalcitrantly, recalcitrantly difficult about not wanting that person to be witnessed to because it would affect their personal peace and prosperity and happiness. And when put it that way, that child had to admit what's more important is their salvation. I hope you understand that that's what Paul's talking about here in this passage even if it affects your personal peace and prosperity and your comfort their salvation is more important and then finally it made us compassionate on others who are in opposing and it moves us to pray for their salvation that's a really changed life. When you can begin to pray for the people who are opposing your testimony and you pray for them not with hatred, not with bitterness, not God will smack them upside the head and kick them into the pit, but that God would save them because he can do it. Is there much for which we can give thanks about our salvation? I think so. There's many more passages too, but we've just taken two short ones and our time's up. But I'd like to close the service in a different way than we usually do. I'd like you to sing with me a little chorus. I think you all know it. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. We'll sing it twice. Will you join me? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free again thank you lord for saving my soul thank you lord for making me whole thank you lord for giving to me thy great salvation 
so rich and free. And all of God's people said, Amen. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever. Amen. Amen. Our closing